Coming out on a Saturday morning, it feels like springtime outside, uh, even though it is January. And I'm really happy to see a full packed house here for Monty. I hope you guys in the back can see the slides that he's going to be presenting. And um, for my introduction, Monty, I, wiki I Wikipedia'd you. <laughs> and I found out some pretty interesting things. Yeah, it says that you're an American graphic artist from Missoula. We kind of we kind of knew that. Um, he called, <laughs> Frommers called you one of the best known artists in Montana, which we all know and are very proud of. Um, that he, Monty works primarily in watercolor, acrylic paint, poster art, and lithographs. And he's got. I'm hoping he'll talk about a couple of his new poster projects that he's um, got on the docket. Um, he works often in whimsical animals in both nature and artificial settings. And as um, something about suburban living room here, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> he has a worldwide following and is considered a key figure in the visual arts in the American West. Um, those of you who are at, were at the opening last night or got to walk around a little bit this morning will notice that um, the latest exhibition that his latest work is a little bit of a departure from some of this and we hope we'll be learning about more of that today. But I also found out that not only did Monty go to Montana State University and the University of Montana, so he's a bobcat and a grizz, <laughs> but he was in a band <laughs> called Out of Sight. <laughs> doesn't give the year for this, but it was a rock band. So maybe he'll tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> um, anyway, what you see in the gallery here has been about a two and a half year project that with the Holter Museum and Monty Dolek. It started with our former curator, Yvonne Sang, and, uh, and, and so he, while we feel like we've worked together, Monty definitely has done the bulk of the work here. <laughs> And we're excited to be exhibiting, um, for the first time, his new exhibition, Altered State. So I'm going to turn this over to Monty Dolak. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm amazed to see so many people here. Thank you so much for turning out on a beautiful Saturday morning. Uh, it's great to be in Helena and see old friends and make new ones. Um, I'd like to thank Sandra for the nice introduction. Wikipediaing me, that's interesting. <laughs> I have to, I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was in the 60s, my band. <laughs> so. um, yeah, I think it was about two and a half years ago that the uh, former curator, Yvonne <laughs> Sang, at, asked me if I would do an uh, exhibition at the Holter. And uh, at that time, none of this work that is in the room right now was, was done, and I really didn't have an idea uh, what it would become. Uh, I knew that uh, I had two or three series of works that I was interested in doing. All of them had to do with, uh, with nature and, and uh, the environment in, in most respects. And, uh, some of my pictures and paintings uh, have focused on, on animals and uh, some on uh, the landscape. And uh, I started thinking about my own family history and uh, I'm a, a, th a third generation Montanan. Uh, my grandfather originally uh, came to Montana as a coal miner and uh, my father worked at the copper refinery in Great Falls, made copper. And I also worked there uh, summers while I was going to school in both Bozeman and Missoula. And uh, was able to see how, uh, how ore that came out of the mines in, in Butte uh, became uh, the copper wire that uh, you know, pretty much uh, was used for communications throughout the world at that time. And the copper wire that came out of Great Falls uh, is still being used in many places, uh, although it's less important now with the digital and uh, communications and cell phones, but uh, still an important, uh, an important metal. And uh, 
I knew I wanted to do some, some paintings that had to do with nature and maybe uh, with uh, how we people have changed, changed it and, and uh, shaped it uh, over really only the last 150 years. I mean, it really was just a little over 200 years ago that, that Lewis and Clark uh, recorded coming up the Missouri and, and uh, when they encountered what is now uh, Great Falls, they saw more animals in one place than they would encounter in any other part of the trip. It was like the Serengeti of America. Vast herds of buffalo and uh, wolves and grizzly bears, uh, uh, antelope, uh, elk, deer. Uh, it was amazing. Um, when I was growing up in Great Falls, uh, there was a large smelter stack uh, uh, located on the river, about 500 feet tall. That exhausted the fumes that came out of the uh, copper and zinc and various metals being refined there. And uh, you were lucky to see a deer. If someone saw a deer, it was, it was, it was worth talking about. And uh, th there were a few uh, uh, Columbia ground squirrels left. And uh, there, really wasn't much, there really wasn't much in the way of wildlife left at all. It really had changed. And uh, I started thinking about uh, the, uh, that relationship uh, between industry and nature, and also about my own personal history and the coal and the copper, and thought, well, maybe it would be interesting to work with those materials and to make some artworks uh, that spoke to that experience uh, and history, and uh, not, not to, uh, you know, necessarily be intensely critical at what industry has done to nature, but just to look at it and try to find uh, something that wasn't didactic or preachy, uh, maybe pictures that were beautiful, but had layers of content in them too, and uh, were made with materials that came from the land, uh, uh, you know, and, and metals that, that came from th this area. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start by just showing some, some earlier pieces that I think relate to the work that's in this room now. And uh, they're, they're a little more humorous, uh, but the, the, and this, this painting is called Suburban Refuge, and I, it was just a, an idea I had. I had sketched out an idea of animals reclaiming uh, human habitat because maybe their swamp had been drained or uh, they had lost their habitat, and uh, this one was the first one, and it led to a whole series that I call the Invaders series, and uh, you know, kind of exploring, uh, but through through humor, I think, uh, more than uh, <laughs> more than irony or or sarcasm, uh, th this uh, this relationship between civilization and nature. These are all the species of penguins, by the way, and that was fun making these pictures. Uh, pr prior to making this series of pictures, I had done a number of posters, uh, and uh, I had also done some film, film posters and uh, record jackets, when record jackets were 12 inches by 12 inches, and were a great, <laughs> a great format. And uh, when I had started, I, was, I, I liked to draw, but I didn't know much about painting. And uh, Going through uh, making these series of uh, posters, I, I learned more and more about design and painting and uh, how to create uh, an, an illusion. And uh, something like this is really a, a, a surrealistic uh, painting. I mean, it, it could happen, but it's not likely to happen. <laughs> uh, and uh, curiously enough, uh, this also has uh, ties that were my dad's ties. And uh, so all the ties in there are, are little historic uh, uh, visual tidbits. Um, let me see if I can move this along. Um, speaking of the, the smelter stack in Great Falls, uh, that's kind of what it looked like there. Uh, the western, in, you know, small, small city, but industrial city. And, uh, on the banks of the Missouri River, you know, uh, what better place to put an oil refinery or a, you know, a, co a copper refinery? And um, for many years, the waste was just exhausted right into the river. Uh, you know, I, I don't think people thought much about it at that time, although there were some that complained. Um, and uh, 
another one. And, and, and as I made these things, uh, and I learned more about the different birds and animals and fish uh, and, uh, that I wanted to put into the pictures, uh, and, and a number of these became posters, and some of you may be familiar with some of them. Uh, while I was doing these paintings, I would also work on commissioned works, and I found myself being drawn to uh, conservation uh, issues and uh, environmental uh, issues, uh, issues of education, and also art in general, theater, and uh, so those were the kinds of commissions uh, that I like to work on. Now the beavers have taken over the cabin here because the uh, owners are out canoeing someplace and uh, the, uh, their, their forest has been uh, clear cut by someone, uh, you can see up in the upper right corner, so they have to find wood where they can. Um, this is kind of an amalgamation of uh, uh, different streets in Montana. There's a little bit of Helena, Missoula, the Great Falls, and Butte kind of in this street. And uh, the only light that's on above the bar is the light in my studio, which was above the Top Hat bar uh, when I painted that. So that's the, that's the light there, besides the street light, which is kind of the artificial moon that the uh, blue heron is flying down the street. I call this one the heron blues. <laughs> Um, this, this speaks uh, to that experience uh, that uh, Lewis and Clark had and historically the native people that lived uh, in and around this incredible area um, and how it was so radically changed in such a short time. Uh, so uh, my, I, I graduated from Great Falls High School in 1968 and uh, on our, I think it was our 30th high school reunion uh, some of the members of my class asked, asked me if I would do a painting that we could present as a gift to our class. And uh, so this is a classroom, a Great Falls High School classroom with uh, you know, the old chalkboards, uh, which there are, there are still there some, in some of the rooms. And uh, our mascot uh, was the bison, yes. the mighty bison. And uh, this is, uh, I call this a, a Montana history lesson speaks a little bit about uh, some of these same issues. Um, and this would be, uh, this is something I was commissioned to do for the Lewis and Clark uh, Bicentennial. Um, and this is the White Cliffs of the Missouri and all the animals uh, that are watching uh, Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery come up the Missouri toward the Shining Mountains. And uh, as, as they pass this, this landscape, it will never be the same. So this is a, a decisive moment uh, in, uh, in Montana history. Um, they didn't see along the, their journey any Native American people. Um, they were off hunting at that time. But uh, I added some, uh, some cliff, uh, petro, petroglyphs, uh, pictographs, excuse me, to represent uh, the Native uh, presence. Uh, And here's, uh, here we are now, um, you know, uh, our rivers uh, are a wonderful place for Montanans to spend time on, fishing, floating, and uh, organizations uh, like Trout Unlimited and Nature Conservancy and other groups have, uh, have helped uh, preserve through uh, uh, well, uh, easements and uh, and actually outright purchasing various important uh, landscapes to preserve them for the future. Uh, and I, uh, this was a painting um, done for uh, Trout Unlimited, the Big Blackfoot chapter. So this is a Big Blackfoot uh, Valley uh, east of Missoula. Um, the wolf is a controversial subject in Montana and uh, the, a group called Defenders of Wildlife uh, asked me to do a, a poster for something they were trying to do at that time in the late 80s, which was reintroduce the wolf to Yellowstone. And I, I wound up making this poster, and I, you know, there were, there were a number of very good wildlife artists around at that time, and I did not think of myself as a wildlife artist. I was interested in nature and interested in making pictures, um, and uh, so, it, 
it probably has more of a, a, a graphic quality than a, you know, a, uh, a true uh, uh, realist re uh, you know, representation. But uh, it, it got the message across and it did happen. This, this is the piece I did for a group that uh, is trying to restore some native prairie. And uh, it's really uh, probably comes closest to what the area around Great Falls looked like when Lewis and Clark came. And there's some areas that uh, uh, still have some untouched prairie grasses. This, this is uh, imagine, imagining Om Pishkin uh, with all the native prairie animals that uh, most of them still exist, although a number of them are threatened and uh, or endangered, like the uh, the uh, black-footed ferret and uh, various uh, various other animals. Um, Square butte in the distance, and uh, this could be a natural history uh, uh, backdrop uh, for a uh, installation or something. Because I, I I worked on this with a it's more of a science project in, in many ways, and uh, which I've always had a, a real interest in. So f a few years ago, I, I started making paintings uh, of, of animals uh, and uh, landscape, and, uh, but also with uh, a subtext of, uh, in this case, the, uh, the stars in the sky are buffalo nickels, and the Indian uh, head on one side and the buffalo on the other. And I, and I call this uh, painting Montana Power. And uh, <laughs> and, and there's the uh, uh, Big Medicine, the, the white buffalo, sacred to uh, native people, and uh, kind of uh, working uh, in a number of uh, social and historic and uh, mythological uh, imagery around uh, the animal that uh, uh, the the animal inspires uh, stories and, and uh, uh, legends, uh, mythologies uh, in, in our, you know, in the Western culture. And uh, so I was trying to speak to those in this. And uh, let's see, we'll move on. And the, the same here, uh, there was kind of a series of, of pictures that I did that had to do with mythology and animals. And uh, I, became interested in mythology and found that uh, cultures all over the world tell stories about themselves by telling a story about an animal and the power of an animal and uh, how maybe uh, the, the people originated. Uh, so uh, oftentimes uh, a, uh, uh, the, the legends and stories are passed on and evolve into, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a fusion of uh, history and, and uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, sometimes uh, spirituality and uh, a connection to, uh, to nature to try to maintain that, uh, that connection, which uh, in our increasingly urbanized uh, lifestyle, we, we are not, not here so much in Montana, but uh, in the world and uh, many places, we are losing that connection. Um, I just wanted to show one of the posters that, uh, that I've made for, uh, this was for the Clark Fork Coalition who's done a lot of work on the Clark Fork tributaries including the removal of the Milltown Dam and, and uh, relocating the sediments and, uh, that uh, were toxic and that were polluting the waters just outside of Missoula. And uh, this is more of an archetypal picture I guess that uh, kind of shows uh, how important wa a water system is and uh, the, the thread of life that runs through it, how water is made, uh, the, the, the mountain in the background that has the glacier on it, uh, there are storms and rain and it collects the moisture and, and uh, feeds the, uh, the streams and springs and uh, eventually the rivers and uh, systems like that are rare on the planet. They're, they're, uh, there are not a lot of them and Montana is the home to one of those places. Uh, that is uh, pretty darn special. And uh, so I think we, we really need to take care of our water. This is up in the scapegoat wilderness. So I, I do like to get out and actually, I, I take photographs, but I, I do sketches and, and uh, paintings on location too. And uh, I'm making these pictures that I've been showing you, 
during this whole process, I was actually out making paintings with my wife, Mary Beth, uh, Mary Beth Percival, who's here, who has shown me, uh, you know, taught me a lot about landscape painting and uh, drawing and, and uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, really take a good look at uh, when you're out, uh, doing field research, colors, and uh, even though later I, I might put a, a, you know, an incongruous object in my landscape, uh, at least I wanted the landscape to be correct. Um, and for instance, I, did, I don't have that picture here, but there's one of a fish rising out of a field with mountains behind it. And it looks like it, it looks real. But um, the, I realized uh, at one point, and I think through looking at artists like René Magritte, the Belgian surrealist, that uh, you, you could bring in, uh, and, you, and you might see that in like some of my, my bird paintings, uh, that uh, if you took two things that may never appear together in reality and brought them together, and if they were both painted with the same degree of accuracy, it, it could become quite believable. And uh, that's uh, one area of the surreal that I use in, in my work. Um, this is the scapegoat wilderness. So I wanted to show a few pieces here that are really about nature, pure nature. And I spent five days in the backcountry riding in by horseback. And uh, that's Scapegoat Mountain. And uh, fortunately, it's an area that is now it's protected. And uh, it's very wild. It's a more intimate uh, kind of painting. This is a, a, a large painting, so it was painted probably life size. Probably about that big. <coughs> Flathead Lake. So, uh, Montana PBS asked me to make a picture for fundraising, uh, and uh, I wound up. Uh, uh, you, portraying the front range and kind of imagining what it might look like if you were a bird looking down on it. And, uh, and then I uh, put myself in uh, as a self-portrait with our dog, Dora, <laughs> wa watching TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was fun. Uh, you know, you see uh, irony and uh, uh, humor all around, uh, and, and sometimes it just, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, we were catching owls with Denver Holt up uh, on Nine Pipe uh, Reservoir, and I happened to see that, that sign, wildlife management sign, and thought, <laughs> that is just so Montana. <laughs> It, anyway, I, I held that owl for about an hour or two and uh, bonded with it and wound up putting him on that sign. And here is the bird many people think should be the Montana State bird, <laughs> a, a survivor. Now this work kind of leads to uh, the work that is in the room. And I'm, I think some of you, maybe all of you, had a chance to look at the, the work that's here. And if you haven't, uh, after this talk, if you have time, please walk around the room. And because it's much nicer to see the real works than the, the colors are a little bit garish in, in what I'm showing you here. Um, I call this one Ascension. And there is one uh, ivory-billed woodpecker in there, along with mostly pileated woodpeckers. And it relates a little bit to a painting that's in the room right now of coal. Um, I made three sculptures uh, f uh, for this, uh, this show. And uh, this isn't one of them, but this is a precursor to it. Um, I enjoy collecting objects, uh, looking for mm, small uh, statues, uh, animals, dinosaurs, cars, uh, just uh, different things. And I have a, a boneyard in my studio, segregated in boxes with all kinds of different uh, potential material for making constructions. And uh, this is uh, one from several years ago. And uh, 
there's a number of different objects, hundreds of them, uh, attached to a surface, and then a lot of filling, and then eventually painting. So this is a riverscape uh, painted over the top of numerous uh, found objects, and it's kind of the story of existence. You know, it starts in the bottom in the ooze with insects and fish and dinosaurs, and it works its way all the way up to jet fighters and uh, space stations, and uh, everything in between. Um, and uh, I wanted to do some, some more pieces like this, and uh, this is another one that's similar to that. It, when I go for walks, uh, Mary Beth and I go, walk our dogs in the morning, I tend to pick up, uh, oh, beer cans or different things people have thrown away just to kind of, you know, pick them up. And uh, I started bringing them back to the studio, crushing the cans, and then I thought, oh, it might be interesting to make, make something out of those. So, the, this is a painting uh, on uh, crushed cans and now there's a piece of barbed wire and just it's knives and forks and old fishing lures, different things I found uh, either along the river or walking down the road. And uh, so this would be a fish spawning in a stream. Uh, I think I called it reunion. Now this is the uh, beginning of, of these works that uh, are over here right now. And uh, when Yvonne Sang asked me to do the pieces, she had seen some of these other works uh, that I've been showing you. And, and she showed the confidence in me to go ahead and, and make a, a room full of works and give me a place to show them that, um, you know, uh, hadn't been done yet. So I, I really do appreciate that and the Holter Museum for allowing me that uh, honor to uh, uh, fill a room with, uh, with the work and, uh, and giving me the opportunity to carry out what I decided to do, which was a series of works. This is, this is what the Milltown, when the Milltown Dam was removed, it, it was right where my hand is here and it was taken out and the river was rebuilt the way a river theoretically moves in these bends. I mean, it'll eventually flood and it'll find its own course, but right now this is like this engineered river, which I thought was interesting. And, uh, and, at, and at one time extremely uh, uh, contaminated with heavy metals and uh, uh, various things that came down the river from the, the mining and uh, smelting up in Butte and Anaconda and lodged behind this hundred-year-old dam. And uh, that's painted on copper. I call this one uh, oil and water. And uh, this is a copper refinery, or excuse me, the oil refinery on the banks of the Missouri in Great Falls that uh, you know, kind of grew up looking at, and I, I had always wanted to paint it because it's, it's real pretty at night with the reflections in the water. And uh, some, something that happened after the, uh, the Anaconda Company uh, was removed from Great Falls was that the, a lot of birds started coming back. Now there's a tremendous number of geese there, and uh, when I was growing up, there were no geese. There were no birds. And uh, this is, uh, is that me? This is uh, the Holter Dam, and uh, I call this a, re a rested river, and it's, uh, it's also painted on copper. And uh, it is, uh, you know, I used to go up the Missouri as far as the dam here, and then many people recreate on the lake, because really it's about midpoint between Helena and Great Falls. But uh, I had always wanted to make a painting of it. I thought it was a, just this amazing structure and, uh, and, and what it does. And, how, how it uh, changes the character of a river, and uh, it also, at the same time, yeah, serves as, uh, as clean power. Uh, same around Great Falls, where there's uh, six dams. Uh, so, in many ways, uh, a little better than burning coal, a lot better. Um, I just thought this was interesting, you know, the, the dichotomy of uh, water use, uh, of rainstorms, of uh, you know, light and darkness. Um, and uh, this again is, uh, is also on copper. And if you get a chance to look at the pieces uh, after the show, the cop, uh, the, I, 
I was able to obtain thick copper, it's thicker than a nickel, and then um, carefully sand it, and then uh, covered it with a clear coat of shellac, which is an inert organic material that keeps the copper from oxidizing or turning green and let, lets the uh, luminous quality show through the uh, paint layers. So part of making these was to allow that, that iridescence to come through uh, as much as possible. And it was like working on a ground. Many artists, when they make a painting, they don't work on a white surface. They'll put a colored ground down, a gray or a, a brownish tone or a, a mid-tone of some kind. So when they make the painting, they can go in with whites and create light areas and go in with darks, create dark areas, and I already have the mid-tone done. So it's almost like the painting's half done. Uh, when, when you work on a white surface, you have to, you know, create darks and then go back and leave light areas. And uh, watercolorists really, are, you know, they have to be very skillful to leave the lightest areas. And uh, uh, so the, the, because uh, uh, the, the watercolor is tran transparent. So. Trying to switch it up. Um, every time I go through Butte, I, I stop and, uh, when I have the time and uh, go to the uh, observation area and, uh, you know, you look down on, on the pit and watch it filling up. And uh, the, the colors are arresting. Um, and I was reminded of the colors that uh, I see when I go to Yellowstone Park, uh, which uh, nature is sort of uncovered. Uh, the, uh, the yellows and reds and oranges uh, from the various minerals and, and metals that are exposed. Um, uh, th I call this one sacred and profane. Uh, Our Lady of the Rockies is reflected in the water. Uh, it's not really water, it's a solution of uh, acid and uh, uh, oh, you know, various uh, metals and uh, it's a very complex solution. And I think everyone knows the story of the 300 snow geese that landed on it, mistaking it for a mountain lake uh, about, about 12 or 15 years ago and all died because it was just so toxic. So that's at the headwaters of the Clark Fork. So, um, and, and there's speculation as to whether it will ever fill up and, uh, you know, uh, spill over or if they will continue to uh, they, they do have a treatment center there, and they are treating uh, the, the water that uh, continues to rise. It's curious. And so this was one uh, that uh, I think uh, speaks to the wildlife and, uh, and the, uh, the, the lake, the uh, Berkeley pet. Another uh, uh, stream that's uh, between uh, here and, uh, well, it's closer to, closer to Butte on, on the way to Missoula is Silverbow Creek. And uh, it used to be so toxic that uh, nothing lived in it, not even insects. Um, and it uh, had uh, tributaries coming down from Anaconda from the settling ponds and whatnot. <laughs> and and th this has really been cleaned up. Now there are fish in it. Uh, whether you'd want to eat them or not, I don't know, but they, there are living things in there now. So there, there are some success stories here, and uh, you know, uh, there are people working on uh, remedia remediation, and uh, there's quite a few projects uh, going on now, and I think awareness has really increased, although they're still uh, talking about opening new mines in, uh, at the headwaters of important rivers. Uh, the, uh, the wind generation is another source of power, as like the, uh, like the dams, and, uh, and, it, and it's clean, and, uh, you know, but there, there are, uh, you know, uh, some powerful implications there, too, and uh, uh, I, f I find that uh, they're interesting to, uh, to look at. When I uh, grew up in Great Falls, you'd, you knew you were getting close to Great Falls when you saw the smelter stack. And you could be quite a long ways away and you'd see a little bit of it there and know you were getting close to home. Now you can kind of see the tops of some of these because they're, I think they're about 300 feet tall. Yes. These are some sketches and uh, what I found is that I, I thought I would show these because um, 
Silver Bow Creek, uh, this uh, ball of wire with the bird on it, and mm -hmm. uh, actually the stack smoke, which is, uh, I had wanted to make a painting of the uh, smelter stack being blown up, to, which was a, a, a time when things changed. And all three of these little sketches wound up becoming um, finished paintings. And the, the process of making a painting, it, it, for me it comes with an idea first. And uh, the idea can just be a, a little, a small drawing that's a little map in a way. Um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll, be give, you'll be giving directions to your house or someplace to a friend and you'll make a really quick map. You know, uh, you're here, I'm here, turn here, go here. And you can draw it in a few minutes and, uh, and people can find your house. It's, it's not a, you know, detailed map, and, uh, uh, but it works. And, uh, and in a way, that's what these are. And uh, so I, I would have a, you know, the idea was much more complex and expansive than the time I maybe had to make a quick sketch, which was an evening we were spending at the Grand Union Hotel in Fort Benton. And, uh, but it was, it, what was interesting is three, three of them, uh, maybe four of them, uh, I didn't get to the Mike Horse piece, uh, I, but it, it, it may happen, so. And good advertising for the Grand Union. It's a great place. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were out north of Lewistown, uh, and I saw this ball of barbed wire. Uh, and actually, I saw it in a little different place. It was a, a, a rancher's uh, driveway turnoff. But uh, it was about six feet tall. And uh, ah, it was just an interesting sculptural presence. Uh, and, the idea of uh, eliminating barbed wire and, uh, you know, uh, opening up uh, uh, spaces again uh, that uh, had been divided, uh, I, th I thought was interesting. And uh, so uh, uh, I have an interesting title for this that I can't think of right now. Uh, <laughs> Sphere of Influence. Uh, every time I go by this uh, teepee in, in Browning, I, I, I had thought, I'd, I'd like to make a painting of that someday. That, that's just, you know, very interesting. And uh, so uh, I call this roadside attraction, and it's on copper, too. The, uh, <clears throat> my, my father spent close to 40 years working at the, we called it the smelter, but it was the Anaconda Copper Refinery. And I know there's some people here that work there, too. We were talking, and uh, I worked in a few different departments uh, in the uh, copper refinery itself, where they had three m mammoth furnaces that ran 24 hours a day. There were three shifts, and you'd work nights, afternoons, or days. And uh, two were always running full time, and one was being torn down and rebuilt. Uh, so uh, there were. Uh, it was non-stop making of copper, and the copper that was made there would, would be cast into ingots that would go to the wire mill and be turned into long strands, miles of wire, one, one bar. And uh, copper is very interesting. Uh, painters have been using it for over 500 years. Um, many of the great uh, uh, painters of the Renaissance painted on copper. But at that time, they were looking for a stable surface, and they had a, a couple of choices, canvas, uh, linen or wood, which could buckle, and then copper uh, was available. And uh, every painting I've been able to look up or find that was painted on copper was gessoed first, so the iridescent quality wasn't part of what they were looking for. It was the permanence, the fact that copper is antimicrobial, it doesn't rust, uh, it is uh, inert, bugs don't eat it, uh, could survive a flood. Um, pretty stable uh, uh, surface, substrate, uh, for an artist. This would be the, the front range, and I, and I call this fossil fueled, um, and the contrails uh, in the sky and the pump jacks uh, on the front range. Uh, they always kind of looked like dinosaurs or big grasshoppers or something. And, uh, uh, when I originally started this, I have a sketch here that has a, has a dinosaur, and there have been uh, uh, paleontologists, uh, Jack Horner for one, discovered uh, Egg Mountain very close to this, and uh, there, there are a number of, uh, of sites uh, that uh, 
have Cretaceous outcroppings uh, where there are, they, there are uh, dinosaur bones that are found. Um, and, you know, that relates to the, the oil that's down there, which is a fossil fuel. And, uh, and of course, the burning of that fossil fuel uh, is happening all around us. I, I, I thought that was interesting. And a nice sunset, too. I kind of like the sunset. <laughs> this is another sunset, so. Um, this is kind of massive particulate. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, and it kind of relates to the earlier one of the trees ascending. And uh, I call this suspension of belief. And uh, on our way over here from Missoula yesterday, we passed four, at least four, really long coal trains headed west. And uh, when I first decided I wanted to work with coal, maybe paint coal and maybe even sculpt with it, uh, I called around Missoula. I wanted to buy some coal. No one had any for sale. Well, it was not available. Uh, friends suggested you should just go walk along the tracks and see what you can find, you know, hunt and pick. And uh, I was kind of reminded of, uh, you know, uh, Russian peasants uh, walking along the track trying to find a little coal to keep warm with. And, uh, but a, a friend over in uh, Helena and another friend in Missoula had some coal connections. And uh, one is working with some uh, ranchers, uh, Brenda, uh, over in the Powder River uh, area and was able to get me some anthracite coal, which is hard and shiny. And some of it is fossil <coughs> bearing. So you'll see some of these actually have the plant uh, plants in them. And uh, it's a, a prairie scene. There's some birds in the sky. So I finally got some coal. And uh, in this case, I, I uh, broke the coal down. I, Double bagged it. I had some nice big lumps. They were, you know, uh, kind of uh, real pretty things that I used for that earlier painting. And but I wanted to actually paint with them or on them. So I, uh, I got a hammer out and I hammered on the coal and then I sieved it through a screen with quarter inch uh, holes. Uh, and until I was able to get a consistent size of, of coal particles and then uh, segregated those and. Uh, epoxied them to a surface, and uh, I, was, I was interested in what's happening at the Bakken because uh, the, uh, the uh, satellite photos that have been taken in the last few years show this very bright area between Minneapolis and, and uh, Portland and uh, Spokane, Missoula, and uh, in fact, it's quite bright. And if you've, any of you have seen those photographs, you know that the light that is being put out from the flaring of the Bakken oil fields is brighter than major cities. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of flaring going on. And uh, so this is uh, acrylic on coal, and I call it circadian disruption. <laughs> this is the Smith River. Uh, which uh, I w was able to float this summer and on a research trip for a painting I will be making uh, for Montana State Parks, uh, which will celebrate their 75th anniversary. Uh, the Smith River is uh, one of our state parks, and there's over 50 of them. And, uh, but it's delicate, too, and uh, there are some threats, so I, I made up fr a frame out of coal in this case. And, uh, there's a number of boats on the river, too, because we love it and we use it, um, but it's, it's well taken care of, too. And it, the first time I went on it years ago, there was no permit system. You could just go. And, uh, and now there's a permit system to keep uh, the number of people on there at any one time manageable. But it's, uh, it's fabulous. Not far from here. So these are, uh, I call this one a, a marriage of convenience, and uh, it's, uh, these are two figures made out of coal, and in, inside of them is a lot of plaster and steel, and uh, a, a man and a woman, coal and Colette. <laughs> This, this is another uh, construction and sculpture, and uh, it's, uh, 
That's about three or four hundred dinosaurs. Um, and I call, I call this one Fossil Fueled 2 <laughs> because it relates to uh, those, those uh, the earlier painting we saw and the, the uh, consumption of uh, fossil fuels to, to run our, our favorite machines. And, and uh, one thing that was interesting is when I was making this, every time I would walk out into my studio and look at it, it would make me smile, which is kind of, a, <laughs> kind of pleasant. And I call, I call this one uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. And uh, I was collecting cars and dinosaurs for about three years, knowing I wanted to make something out of them. And uh, when I started making the dinosaur out of cars, that's when I thought it might be interesting to make a car out of dinosaurs. So <laughs> it kind of a, a relationship between the two. And uh, this uh, is uh, thanks to a number of people that contributed their children's cars, and even a few <laughs> children that contributed their cars, which was an act of great charity. And I had a few of my own, too. And uh, as, I, as I built this thing, which is about three feet long, out of these ma matchbox cars, which are two to three inches long, um, I, uh, I uh, realized, uh, uh, as, I, as I studied uh, the dinosaur, uh, uh, the bones, and where the muscles attached, and I, I did do a dinosaur painting for a Nature Conservancy uh, a painting that became a poster for Egg Mountain. And I worked with Jack Horner over in Bozeman, the paleontologist, who's very concerned that his dinosaurs be correct. So I wanted my dinosaur to be correct, even if it was made out of cars. And uh, so there's some really good ones buried underneath that I, at one point I thought I had the right muscle layer of cars and muscle cars. And, and <laughs> And then I, I would look at it and come in the next day and go, God, that needs to come out a little farther. So I'd, I'd put another layer of cars, and there were some really good ones that are inside there that got buried. <laughs> anyway, that's just about the end. Um, I just wanted to close with this, because uh, Caleb, uh, who I've worked with here and is the current director, uh, loves to fish, and, uh, and so do I, and I love to spend time on rivers. And, uh, I didn't want all of these to be, uh, you know, kind of a doomsday note. We, we still have beautiful rivers and opportunities in Montana uh, to get out there. And uh, uh, Norman McLean wrote a book called A River Runs Through It. And uh, the last line in the book is, I am haunted by waters. And I think I am. Uh, thank you.